Gerald R. McDermott is the Anglican Professor of Divinity at Beeson Divinity School, where he has served since 2015. He is the author, co-author, or editor of many books, including A Trinitarian Theology of Religions with our own Harold Netland, Jonathan Edwards Confronts the Gods, The New Christian Zionism, Fresh Perspectives on Israel and the Land, Cancer, a Medical and Spiritual Guide for Patients and Their Families, and Famous Stutterers. His academic research has had three foci, Jonathan Edwards, Christian Understandings of Other Religions, and the Meaning of Israel. In fact, Jerry's most recent book is called Israel Matters, and that's coming out very soon, a few months from now. Okay, it's hot off the press. It's a 2018 title, I guess, but it's already out. Okay. It's out. <laughs> uh, Jerry's book, The Theology of Jonathan Edwards, co-authored with Michael McClymond, who's also been one of our speakers here, won Christianity Today's 2013 award for top book in theology and ethics. Before arriving at Beeson, McDermott was the Jordan Trexler Professor of Religion at Roanoke College, where he taught beginning in 1989. An Anglican priest, he is teaching pastor at Christ the King Anglican Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And he comes to speak to us this morning uh, on a topic whose title is different from the title you saw on the posters. The real title today is Jonathan Edwards and the Lost World of God's Creation. And it's from Jerry's new book entitled, Heaven and Earth are Full of the Glory, God's Fingerprints in All of Reality. It's a great treat for me to welcome my good friend Jerry back to Trinity's campus. Would you please join me in welcoming him to the lectern? Well, thank you, Doug. And you'll have to uh, uh, bear with me if I stutter. I'm, I'm a stutterer. That's why I, book, I wrote the book that also came out last year called Famous Stutterers from Moses to Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, Jonathan Edwards and the Lost World of God's Creation. Most people in the world wander through life without seeing its full meaning. Christians know its meaning, but they often miss the embedded meaning in the world out there all around them. They know that God created the world and that he will bring the world to an end. Some Christians know that the end will not take God's people to a heaven in the sky, but to a renewed world right here. But most Christians have been trained not to see the innumerable, or, or I should say most Protestants have been trained not to see the meaning of the innumerable parts of this world or of the world itself. They have been conditioned to see beyond the earth and its heavens to a realm fundamentally removed from what they can see. They miss the glory of the Lord that is all around them in this world and these heavens, which the seraphim extolled to Isaiah and the great liturgies proclaim, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Now let me try to illustrate. Now I, I, I hear a background echo. Do you hear that? Uh, can we fix that? Now let me try to illustrate how we can see and not see at the same time. Uh, take that, that handout that's on your table and look at that, that little blob of a picture. Uh, try, now uh, I'd like to ask you to try staring at, the, at, at those four dots in the picture for 30 to 60 seconds. So, so let's pause here and just stare at those dots and turn and look at that bright wall. And what do you see? 
hopefully, at least some of you, or hopefully most of you, will see an image of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, or something approximating that. <laughs> of course, this is only an image and not the refulgent glory. Yet it demonstrates my point. The glory of the Lord is right in front of us, but we usually don't see it. Disenchantment. This gap between perception and reality was not always so large. For millennia, the cosmos had seemed to most men and women to be a source of wonder, an infinitely complex mystery with unsearchable beauties and intriguing harmonies. They believed the universe was a sign with meaning, but that the meaning is often missed. As the 12th century theologian Hugh of St. Victor wrote, the whole sensible world is like a kind of book written by the finger of God, that is, created by a divine power. And each particular creature is somewhat like a figure. A medieval synonym for picture. Not invented by human decision, but instituted by the divine will to manifest the invisible things of God's wisdom. But in the same way that some illiterate, if he saw an open book, would notice the figures but would not comprehend the letters, so also the stupid an animal man who does not perceive the things of God may see the outward appearance of these visible creatures, but does not understand the reason within. Now, by the animal man, Hugh probably meant the person who sees nothing of God's glory or else has a sense of a creator but does not let it affect him. But in the beginning of this quote, Hugh speaks for millions perhaps billions in the church who have seen God's glory through the things that have been made, as Paul put it in Romans 1. They have not only sensed something beautiful in the glories of the world around and above and in them, but they've also sensed something of what Hugh called God's wisdom in and through the creatures he made. They resonated with Jesus' saying that the lilies of the field and the birds of the air show that God will provide for his people since God provided for them and yet loved his people far more than he loved the lilies and the birds. And if God was speaking through lilies and little sparrows, they surmised, then he was probably also speaking through wine and bread and vines and lights as his, as Jesus's stated connections to these things suggested. But in the modern age, fewer Christians have been able to see messages like this in the creation, especially Protestants. They've been affected by two things, growing secularism that refuses to acknowledge that we in the world are the creation of God, and certain theologies that discount even believers' abilities to discern meaning in the creation. Uh, I think I'm going to need some more water. Uh, I, if you get me a cup, I, I'd greatly appreciate that. But in the modern age, fewer Christians have... Um, whoop, um, we've all heard about the first cause. Thank you of Christians being less able to understand the meaning of creation, secularism, and its gradual disenchantment of the world. We've heard from historians and sociologists that more and more people become convinced or became convinced that the world's origin could be explained by science, that the cosmos came to be regarded as a predictable machine made by God and then when faith in God dissolved, it was seen as a cold universe born from randomness and therefore inimical to lasting personhood and love. 
Most of us learned in college history classes that this disenchantment of the world started with the Copernican Revolution that made humanity the center and measure, replacing the, in, the infinite God with finite man, broken in his relationships and partial in his vision. It made sense to us that moderns started to turn their focus from what was beyond limit, God, to what they could know within their limits, the human being and his nearby world. If we took a bit of philosophy in college, we learned that the German philosopher Immanuel Kant limited knowledge even further by arguing that we can never know things as they really are, either God or things closer to us, but only our own thoughts about God and things. We might have also read the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard and his so-called leap of faith. He probably never actually used this term, but there's little doubt that he persuaded generations of readers that they must leap over reason and this world to get to ultimate truth. It's unfortunate if this is all they gained from Kierkegaard, for he rightly stressed the flip side of reason's inability to know the triune God, namely the soul's capacity for communion with the triune God in its subjective or personal knowledge. University students in the last few decades often felt reinforced by Kierkegaard in what they already had intuited, both from their own experience and, and from the atmosphere of most universities, that reason cannot prove God or say anything certain about God other than that his existence is doubtful. There's also what could be called a denominational difference. The 16th century Protestant reformers argued that late medieval Catholic theology had too much confidence in reason. Luther and Calvin insisted that Roman theologians of their day failed to recognize sufficiently that reason, like every other part of the human person, was tainted by the fall. And that this was why reason could not be relied upon to see in the creation anything truthful about God. Since reason was a gift of nature and not grace, Protestants tended to conclude that the world of nature is fundamentally different from the sphere of grace. So that the beauties of the world have no fundamental or primary relation to the beauty of God. And even if they do, sin has so damaged our eyesight that we cannot see that relation rightly. In fact, our sin-damaged eyes are not capable of seeing anything about the true God from reason and nature alone. But more importantly for Protestants, God has shown us everything we need to know in the Bible. And the main story there is about salvation and especially justification. And according to the Protestant reformers, too many Catholics had misused the creation to argue for what Luther called a theology of glory, which assumed that they could know what was important to know about God through reason and nature alone. Luther proposed that the only way to know the true God was through the cross of Jesus Christ. Protestants generally agreed with this, as did many Catholic theologians in the next centuries. But while Catholics continued to sustain a robust theology of creation, Protestants tended to let their understanding of creation become eclipsed by their overwhelming emphasis on redemption. Some even went so far as to claim that there is no such thing as revelation through the creation. It didn't help matters that the formidable trinity of the long 19th century, Darwin, Marx, and Freud, seemed to confirm Western culture's growing disenchantment of the world. However much some Christians labored to reconcile macroevolution with God's creative work, Charles Darwin persuaded millions and millions that God was not needed to begin or sustain the world. 
Karl Marx told moderns that God talk is merely a drug, the opiate of the masses, that enables the weak to cope with their economic and social hardships. Freud pointed not at society as Marx did, but at inner desire, claiming that religion is wish fulfillment. Like Marx, Freud insisted it was only the weak who need religion. For all three of these modern prophets, the world was no longer a beautiful mystery created by a glorious God, but an arena for the survival of the fittest, Darwin, or the exploitation of the proletariat, Marx, or the stage for conflict between the superego and the id, Freud. While Christians rejected the atheism of these three thinkers, many agreed with parts of their projects. Some Christians accepted the new creation story of natural selection, but said God initiated and perpetuated that process. Most Christians sympathized with Marx's concern for the downtrodden and recognized the evil of economic exploitation, especially by one class against another. Many Christians also saw Freud as opening up the ways that sin works in child-parent relations and in the depths of the unconscious. Yet, by training Christian attention on how nature might have originated species, and the manner in which history and human nature colluded to produce economic oppression and the ways that human nature was conflicted, it became more difficult for Christians to see the glory of God in nature. Besides, Darwin faulted the church's literal, interp literal interpretation of creation Marx protested the church's acceptance of class differences, and Freud decried the church's teaching about sexual sin. Christians couldn't help wondering if the church might be wrong about creation too. Perhaps, they concluded, the medieval church's assumption that nature speaks in a variety of ways was just another illusion that secular prophets were unveiling. More recently, the new atheists have claimed to lend the authority of science to the world's disenchantment. Richard Dawkins is probably the most famous of this new tribe. In his book, The Blind Watchmaker, he tried to refute the argument for God from the apparent design of the universe. In 2006, he published The God Delusion which claims that the more one uses reason to understand science, the more one sees that there is no God. When reason looks at the stars above, the earth beneath, and the soul within, one finds not God, he claims, but final randomness and meaninglessness. The world does not care, and love is something we imagine, but which is finally ephemeral. This should not surprise us, Dawkins said in a recent BBC documentary, quote, why should it be anything other than bleak? I mean, there's no caring about the universe. Why should there be? Why should the universe care about what happens to us? Close quote. Most Christians, of course, do not pay attention to Dawkins and his ilk. As Alistair McGrath and David Bentley Hart have shown these new skeptics are astonishingly ignorant of basic philosophy and theology. For example, they typically treat the Christian God as one more being in a world of beings, which is radically alien to the God and metaphysics of the Bible. Scripture's God is being itself, and in fact, beyond being, so that all beings and all the world are in him, as Paul put it to the Athenian philosophers on Mars Hill, in him we live and move and have our being. They tend to conceive God, the, the new atheists, uh, tend to conceive of God as the 17th and 18th century deists did, as a finite being who created the world with its laws of nature 
and then sat back to observe it and occasionally intervene. Yet there's a way in which the new, new atheists affect Christians. They concentrate on the moral evil in the world that they think disproves a good God. For he does not stop the greatest human evils. He did not stop the greatest human evils, such as the German Holocaust, the Soviet Gulag, and the Cambodian killing fields. They delight in exposing the vicious killing of non-human nature, red in tooth and claw, where life seems to require death on a regular basis. What appear to be innocent animals are routinely attacked and killed with savagery by bigger animals. They then ask how a good and loving God could have invented such a vicious system of nature. Now, Christians know, I mean, most Christians know there are good replies to these objections. They know that sin started a chain of life and death so that nat nature both outside and inside of us is fallen. It groans with us. Nature groans with us, Paul tells us, for its, its redemption one day in Romans 8. So while nature contains immense beauty and grandeur, it's also racked by what we would call tragedy. Now, many Christians also find it ironic. I think I'm going to need more water. <laughs> uh, also find it ironic that many of these same skeptics, both readers who cheer the new atheist rejection of traditional monotheistic religion and some of the new atheists themselves, treat the natural world as divine. It's a growing belief in the West that the physical cosmos is animated by an impersonal spirit called Gaia, or the goddess, despite the fact that this spirit is not regarded as a person in the way that monotheists think of God. And so in other words, thanks. Um, so in other words, while the cosmos is regarded by these devotees as more than physical, with some sort of super natural as in above or beyond nature, power driving it forward. The power is in it or a thing, not a he or a she, as the word goddess would suggest. Something like the Hindu Brahman or the Taoist Tao. And, and neither of the latter two is a person or a god, small g god, but the impersonal spirit or essence of all that is what we might call a directed energy. The ironic element is that while the new atheists and their readers mock Christians for believing that a good God created a good world, they treat that same world with a similar reverence for the spirit that lies in and behind it. Even Dawkins, who disdains the Gaia hypothesis for its suggestion that the cosmos, that, that, that the cosmos works to optimize life, writes glowingly of the cosmos's appearance of design. Now, those are his words. That contains such complexity and beauty. Now, now these are Dawkins' words. That William Paley, as Dawkins put it, hardly ever began to, to um, hardly ever began to state the case. So, today's skeptics are not very convincing, it seems to me but they've gotten an inordinate amount of attention in the media and blogosphere. Their voices at times have been so noisy that the atmosphere seems to keep sounding their echoes. Some Christians as a result have lost confidence, intellectual confidence, theological confidence. They are less prone to celebrate the creation as full of the glory of God and far more prone to wonder what, if anything, nature tells us of the divine? Biblical joy. Now consider the irony. Moderns are proud of the fact that they now know that the world is not enchanted. Yet these same moderns, indoctrinated by Darwin, Marx, and Freud, have run to psychiatrists and counselors because of more per capita depression than perhaps in any period of history. The biblical authors 
in telling contrast, right of joy to be found amidst suffering. At the heart of that joy is a vision of the world as full of the glory of God. As John Calvin put it, the world is a theater of God's glory. Calvin wasn't saying anything new. The great tradition from Origen and Augustine through John of Damascus and Thomas to Bonaventure saw the world as a thing of wonder, studded with beautiful and mysterious signs pointing beyond themselves. They all agreed with what the fourth century theologian Ephraim of Syria wrote. Quote, in every place, if you look, Christ's symbol is there. And wherever you read, you will find his types. For in him, all creatures were created, and he traces his symbols on his property. Close quote. Now, Ephraim was articulating what most Christians believe for most of the church's first 17 centuries, that the universe is an immense Trinitarian symbol with every corner of the cosmos bursting with divinely given meaning. All the Christian thinkers drew on what the biblical authors thought obvious to any reasonable person. Quote, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork, Psalm 19. It's only the fool who looks at the heavens above or the moral law within and says, there is no God, Psalm 14. It seemed absolutely obvious to anyone not prejudiced that, as Paul put it, what can be known about God is plain to human beings because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made in the heavens above and the world below. So they are without excuse. Romans 1. Paul went on to suggest that those who are intellectually honest will look into their own hearts and realize that what is written on their hearts is what God's law requires to which the conscience bears witness. Romans 2. Now Jonathan Edwards teased out the implications of this biblical vision. He accepted the biblical suggestions that all the world is full of types. Now that's the theological term, uh, tupos, it comes from the Greek word tupos. It very, very roughly and approximately means something like symbol. And proceeded to lay out this vision, a God-given symbol that God has put there, not just some, some symbol that we construct. He proceeded to lay out this vision with a clarity and a fullness that have, in my opinion, have not been duplicated. So now, now, now to get to Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards believed that every square inch of the cosmos is a sign that speaks and shows. The message is as near infinite as the universe itself because it was made by the infinite God. But the message has a code that must be cracked word by word, sentence by sentence, to tell the story that is inscribed within. The story is of the infinite personal being who decided to create a cosmos with a little speck called Earth, populated by creatures called human beings. These little creatures were somehow made to be like God himself, at least like him insofar as they have a capacity to think and to love and to enjoy. But they abused those spectacular privileges and rejected him. He won them back by becoming one of them, subjecting his infinite self to their, by comparison, infinitely tiny capacities and permitting them to disrespect him, to abuse him, and then torture and kill him. But then he was lifted from the dead and in the same body came back to life. It was through that shocking series of events the life and death and resurrection of the God-man, that God won those magnificent but perverse creatures back to himself. Now, according to Edwards, this is the counterintuitive story that is told by every square inch of the cosmos. Story of redemption, not just creation. Uh, to be more precise, a tiny part of that story is told by each tiny part of the cosmos. But if a person does not have what Edwards called the sense of the heart, which is given by the Holy Spirit, then that person will never crack 
the coat. He or she will get neither that little bit of the story and probably not the whole story at all. And so in other words, that person will not be able to read the signs for they will be in a foreign language. Edwards used exactly those sorts of words for this story. He said it's a language one has to learn, just like learning a language of this world. But you have to go to the other world, as it were, to learn the language of the message, because the message comes from the, comes from the other world about this world. Even though every bit of this story is inscribed within a part of the big story. Here is Edwards on the extent of God's messaging. Quote, I am not ashamed to own that I believe that the whole universe, heaven and earth, air and seas, be full of images of divine things. So much so that there is room for persons to be learning more and more of this language and seeing more of that which is declared in it to the end of the world without discovering it all. God has a reason for his method, said Edwards. The reason is that he is a communicating God, those are his words, who is always speaking, always imprinting his creation with messages, and always revealing more and more of his beauty. But that characteristic in, in always communicating being is only penultimate, not ultimate. It's an end or purpose of his works, but not his last end. The last end of everything this God says and does in creating and then redeeming is to bring glory to himself. 18th century skeptics said, that sounds selfish. Edwards replied, well, it is selfish if bringing joy and beauty and love to his creatures is selfish. So the purpose of imprinting the entire creation, now that was supposed to be a laugh line, but I guess it didn't go over well. So, so the purpose of imprinting the entire creation is for the sake of glorifying himself. But that happens only when his creatures find their greatest joy in seeing his beauty. And that beauty is, in a word, love. And all the beauties of this world, from the beauty of the intricate design of a simple cell in a simple leaf from a simple tree to the phantasmagoria of a distant galaxy seen from the top of a mountain on a cloudless night to the splendor of Mozart's Moonlight Sonata to the beauty of the most beautiful woman in recent history, Mother Teresa. All of these earthly beauties are but refractions of the beauty of the self-denying servant love of the three persons of the Trinity. In Edwards's language, all these beauties are types or images of which the antitype, which means the referent or the thing to which the type points, is the eternal beauty of the mutual love among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now Edwards had plenty of critics in his day, even on typology. Liberals of his day, and 18th century liberals, believe it or not, denied the Trinity, the blood atonement, and an eternal hell, just as they do today. They also denied types. Uh, others criticized Edwards for going too far, for finding a type, you know, a type under every bush, as it were. And, and Edwards, Edwards's response was, in effect, no, no, there's not a type under every bush. There's really two under every bush. <laughs> both the insects under the bush and the roots that feed the bush. They're all typological. <laughs> now, Edwards defended himself by going to the Bible. He argued the usual case that the Old Testament is full of types that point to New Testament antitypes. But, but then he went further. Not only is the Exodus a type of salvation and kings David and Solomon types of Messiah Jesus as king, but every stroke of the pen in the Old Testament was typical. Now, how do we know that, Mr. Edwards? Well, he said, look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. After recounting certain events when the Israelites were wandering in the, wilderness, in the Sinai wilderness, and then Paul writes, all these things were written for our instruction. And here's a quote from Edwards. 
Thus, almost everything that was said or done that we have recorded in Scripture, that, that, that we have recorded in Scripture from Adam to Christ, was typical of gospel things. Persons were typical persons. Their actions were typical actions. The cities were typical cities. The nation of the Jews and other nations were typical nations. The land was a typical land. God's providences towards them were typical providences. Their worship was typical worship. Their houses were typical houses. Their magistrates, typical magistrates. Their clothes, typical clothes. And indeed, the world was a typical world. Everything in there is a type. Like much of the church for most of his last 2,000 years, Edwards believed that Mount Zion in Jerusalem are types of the church of the saints. But unlike much of the church, he was not a supersessionist who believed that the church entirely replaced Israel. Unlike many evangelicals who insist in enlightenment fashion that every text has only one meaning. And unlike many Christians who think like Occamite nominalists that the simplest explanation is always the best, Edwards followed the great tradition's fourfold sense of scripture and was able to see multiple layers of meaning in the same text. He was able to do ontology, which means talk about being and existence, in the way the Bible does it, I would say. In other words, he employed the Christological principle of coherence and the Trinitarian principle of, of perichoresis, both of which mean that God's reality and therefore creaturely realities are able to have two or more things going on at the same time. God, Christ is both God and man. The Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father, and the two by the Spirit are in the believer. At the same time that the whole church is in Christ, and the whole world is in God in some mysterious sense. In Him we live and move and have our being, as Paul told the Athenian philosophers. Therefore, a text about Jerusalem or Mount Zion and can refer as a type to the future Gentile church at the same time that it speaks in quite literal fashion about the future of Jewish Israel. Now, Edwards went further than most of the tradition on typology, for he insisted that the New Testament is full of types too. The dove on Jesus' head at his baptism was a type of the Holy Spirit. So were the tongues of fire on the heads of the 120 and the rushing of wind at Pentecost. These were all types. Not only that, but the New Testament itself teaches us to look outside the Bible for types. When Jesus proclaimed that he was the true light and the true vine and the true bread, he implied, says Edwards, that all lights and vines and breads in this world are types, pointers to they're antitypes in Jesus. Paul did the same for seed and sowing in springtime when he used them in 1 Corinthians 15 to argue for the resurrection of bodies. Unless God intended seed and planting to be earthly types of spiritual realities, Paul's argument would not have made sense. Quote, here, here, now, now here's Edward speaking. If the sowing of seed and its springing were not designedly ordered by God, to have an agreeableness to the resurrection, there could be no sort of argument in that, which the apostle, in that which the apostle alleges, either to argue the resurrection itself or the manner of it, either its certainty or probability or, possi or possibility, close quote. If types are in nature, Edwards said, they can also be found in non-biblical history. Now, Edwards wrote in his enormous Types of the Messiah, a book, really, but for him it was a notebook, that, quote, many things in the state of the ancient Greeks and Romans were typical of gospel things. For example, his images notebook contains a long entry comparing the celebration of a military triumph in the Roman Empire to Christ's ascension. Just as the Roman emperor's triumphal chariot was followed by senators and ransomed citizens, Christ was accompanied on his return to glory by principalities and powers and ransomed citizens of heaven. The Roman procession was closed by the sacrifice of a great white ox. So too Christ at the ascension entered the Holy of Holies with his own blood. The Roman emperor 
treated the people in the capital with gifts, and Christ did the same for his church. Now, Edwards went further still to the history of religions. He proposed that God has planted types of true religion even in religious systems that are finally false. Now, this is hard for most Christians today to fathom. But Edwards was nothing if not a daring thinker, yet always within the bounds of the great tradition of orthodoxy. His adventurous step was to say that the near universal practice of sacrifice in world religions was planted by God as a type of the perfect sacrifice of God's son. Even the ghastly practice of human sacrifice inspired by the devil was permitted by God to prepare peoples for the sacrifice made by the God-man. Now, Edwards also taught that pagan idolatry in which deities were believed to inhabit material forms was a type of the true incarnation. Furthermore, he believed pagan sacrifices showed the heathen that sin must be suffered for, and therefore their need for God's mercy. Yet Edwards warned that typology can go off the rails. It's, now, it's not a problem to see types everywhere because they are everywhere, but it is a problem to interpret them wrongly as sometimes happens. So originist speculation, as it's been called because of origin's tendency to take the material things of scripture as types of spiritual things, can flee from history, which Edward says is the proper domain of orthodox typology, to allegorical generalizations about human existence in general. Edward said the guardrails on orthodox typology are twofold. First, it must stay within the orthodox story of redemption, which is rooted in historical events. They comprise the great antitype. The story is a huge story with a near infinite number of types, but it's a different story from the myriads of heretical stories and from the myriads of human speculations that are not heretical but merely imaginary. Second, typological speculation takes practice just as it takes practice to learn any language, to learn to read the story. Here are Edwards' words worth quoting at length. Types are a certain sort of language, as it were, in which God is wont to speak to us. And there is, as it were, a certain idiom in that language, which is to be learned the same way that the idiom of any language is learned, namely by good acquaintance with the language, either by being naturally trained up in it learning it by education, uh, but that's not the way in which corrupt mankind learn divine language, or by much use and acquaintance together with a good taste or judgment, by comparing one thing with another and having our senses, as it were, exercised to discern it, which is the way that adult persons must come to speak any language and in its true idiom that is not their native tongue. Great care should be used and we should endeavor to be well and thoroughly acquainted or we shall never understand or have a right notion of the idiom of the language. If we go to interpret divine types without this, we shall be just like one that pretends to speak any language that really has not thoroughly learned it. We shall use many barbarous expressions that fail entirely of the proper beauty of the language that are very harsh in the ears of those who are well versed in the language. God has not expressly explained all the types of scriptures, but he has done so much as is sufficient to teach us the language. Karl Barth. Karl Barth warned that a typological view of the creation is theologically wrong-headed because it presumes that God plants revelation in his creation. So Edwards' view of types in the creation is, according to Barth, not only bad exegesis, but also bad theology. It presupposes natural revelation that does not exist. Bart argued that there's no point of contact, his famous phrase, between things of earth and things of heaven. And that, we'll, and that when we think there is a point of contact, we inevitably confuse the two, assigning something of earth to the heavenly sphere, turning it into a God by trusting in it and loving it. If you think this sounds like Luther, you're on the right track. Bart was steeped in the reformers. Luther as much as Calvin. Luther helped Bart make sense 
of the insanity of early 20th century Europe when millions of young men were mowed down in line after line as they climbed out of filthy trenches to face a faceless enemy whom their leaders had told them was a threat to civilization. Bart was horrified to learn that his liberal theology professors had endorsed this seemingly senseless First World War, confusing German ideals with God's purposes. This made him rethink theology and God himself and drove him back to the reformed scholastics whom he found in Heinrich Heppe's reformed dogmatics. These theologians took seriously what Bart called the strange new world of the Bible. Unlike his liberal theology professors who questioned the historicity of both testaments, these reformed theologians in the 16th and 17th centuries believed God had inspired every word of scripture and that the relation between each word and its historical referent was less important than the fact that the living God was speaking through that word and those words, every single one of them. I think I might need some more water. Then in the 1930s, when the most Christianized country in Europe turned against the Jews, thanks. You can never get enough water. Um, so then in the 1930s, when the most Christianized country in Europe turned against the Jews, and when it, the most educated country in history, by the way, you know what? E even to this day, the country that has had the highest percentage of PhDs and master's degree was 1930s Germany. It, you know, higher education is not the answer. <laughs> And when it, the most educated country in history, allowed itself to believe lies, Bart turned again to Reformed theology and to Luther to make sense of this madness. Bart was struck by Luther's rejection of Aquinas and the medieval doctors turned to this world of being to find analogies to the author of being. Even though Thomas said that these analogies tell us more what God is not than what he is, Luther considered all such analogies to this world to be dead ends. In, in the end, he believed, they turned us to our own ideas of the world and suggest that we can contribute something to the search for God and then to our being accepted by God. In Thomistic theology, this was known as the analogy of being, which asserted that in the creation we can see signposts of the creator, earmarks left by the designer. We can use our unaided reason to study these signposts and earmarks and conclude from them that they point to an intelligent designer. Indeed, a creator with a small c. Um, because Thomas and his followers conceded that the analogy of being does not point to the Trinitarian God per se, but only to an unnamed source. For Bart, this approach to the creation was exactly the one used by the new generation of German theologians who were supporting the religion of blood and soil suggested by an Austrian postcard painter with a preternatural gift of oratory. This failed artist was giving hope to a generation of Germans who felt inferior after the Versailles Treaty had blamed the First World War on them and left them penniless because of the dra draconian reparations demanded by the treaty, Versailles Treaty. Hitler told them that they were not only inferior but superior and his rearmament of Germany was giving them jobs. Now they could put food on the table with self-respect. He told them he read the Bible every day, was protecting them from godless communism, and that God raises up leaders who enable a people to find their God-given strength and destiny. For Bart, this was the handwriting on the wall. This showed why the analogy of being was damnable from the in infernal pit. In fact, the invention of Antichrist. Now those are his words. It claimed to find God in the creation and in a particular people. It makes the human being its own creator and redeemer. 
Now we can understand in hindsight why Bart connected the dots from Thomas's analogy of being to the Nazi Blut und Boden, blood and soil. But that same hindsight reveals that Bart overreached. As Hans Urs von Balthasar argued in his seminal study of Bart's theology, Bart had attacked a straw man. The analogy of being which Bart condemned was not the one taught by Thomas Aquinas. Bart had claimed that for Thomas, nature was able in its purity, apart from grace, to see the meaning of reality. And not only to see, but then to contribute to its salvation. But Thomas never taught such a pure nature that could of its own being, apart from regeneration, see the meaning of nature and the identity of the true God. Thomas always insisted that nature requires grace to find itself and that only the historical event of Christ's life and death and resurrection saves a fallen nature. As Balthazar put it, Thomas wrote that the word did not come to all of nature but to his own and that part, and that, that part of his own who received him had been prepared ahead of time by grace. They were born not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. Therefore, the analogy of being, which depends on grace to see and grace to be redeemed, teaches that being is indeed epiphanic. You know, results in epiphanies. All of nature is created with the capacity to show the grace that birthed it and lies beyond it. For example, all genuine love surrenders to the other and points to the surrender of each divine person to the Trinity's plans for creation and redemption. All of the fallen creation goes through death in order to make way for new life, just as death to sin is necessary for the resurrection of new life in redemption and sanctification. In these two ways and millions of others, the creation shows that God is the fulfillment of the, words of, of the world's being. But only eyes that have been opened by the Holy Spirit can see this. This is where the true analogy of being is different, radically different, from its counterfeits in deism and liberal theology. But Bart was never able to see this distinction or to separate the analogia entis um, Latin for analogy of being, from general revelation in any clear way. For him, the two were of a piece. Claims for both, he thought, assumed an inborn or acquired property of man rather than the result of an act of God. And they assume that man has created his own faith, which we acquire on our own, or involved, as he put it, quote, an abstract metaphysics of God, the world, or religion, which is supposed to obtain at all times and in all places, close quote. Bart insisted in Church Dogmatics 2.1 that Romans 1.18 and following, quote, is not speaking of man in the cosmos in himself and in general, close quote. Paul refers, according to Bart, in Romans 1, not to some knowledge of God possible apart from knowledge of Jesus Christ, but only the truth of revelation proclaimed by the apostle of Jesus Christ. It's impossible, he wrote, to draw from this text in Romans 1 a statement concerning a natural union with God or knowledge of God on the part of man in himself and as such, close quote. In Bart's discussion of Romans 1 and Paul's Mars Hill sermon in Acts 17, he denies any natural analogy between the creation and its creator, thus the analogia entis, and any general revelation available to all apart from the revelation of Jesus Christ. The rejection of the analogy and of general revelation went together for Bart. Now, now, uh, now what about Bart's appeals later in his career to little lights and parables of the kingdom? Did those discussions represent a change of mind on general revelation? Apparently not. Bart argued that the occurrence of such parables was not to be ascribed to the sorry hypothesis of natural theology. As George Hunsinger explains, 
Bart could not accept any true apprehension of God without personal conversion. The idea that there could be objective revelation that was there, even if a person could not apprehend it, was impossible for Bart to accept. James Barr, in his Gifford lecture, lectures that have been published as Biblical Faith and Natural Theology, um, Barr agrees that there was no change in the later Bart. Quote, there was no talk of a revision, still less, still less of an abandonment of the violent earlier attacks on natural theology. Since this is so, we are justified in taking the position of complete denial of natural theology, which is Bart's positions in his Gifford lectures, in his controversy with Bruner, and in the earlier volumes of the Church Dogmatics. All of this is the classic Bardian position. Now, the great Lutheran theologian Wolfhard Pannenberg studied under Bart and saw this problem in Bart's theology. Pannenberg observed that Bart could not distinguish between natural knowledge of God and a natural theology constructed by autonomous man. As a result, according to Pannenberg, Bart created a false dichotomy. Either Enlightenment-style natural theology that thinks natural revelation is enough for saving knowledge of God, or no general revelation at all. Either knowledge of God apart from knowledge of Christ was something possessed by a human being for her disposal, or there was no knowledge of God at all apart from revelation of the gospel. The Dutch Reformed theologian, G.C. Burkauer, joined Pannenberg in criticizing Barth for failing to distinguish between natural theology of the, of, of the Enlightenment sort from explicitly Christian natural theology based on general, general revelation. More recently, Alistair McGrath has added a similar critique, along with a new call for revival of a properly Christian natural theology. Now, I'm going to finish up by getting into the weeds um, to see how Bart misinterpreted scripture. Bart went to the classic texts, not only Acts 17, as we just saw, but also Psalm 19 and Romans 1. On Psalm 19, he pointed to verse 3, their voice is not heard, and argued that the voices of creation are dumb and mute. After all, he wrote, the Old Testament shows that no one outside of Israel knew the true God. On Romans 1, Bart argued, following Luther, that all the so-called revelation of God to man through nature results only in condemnation. Therefore, Bart reasoned, since the testimonies of God in nature are invariably misunderstood, they are not revelation at all. They falsify rather than illumine. The only true knowledge we, we have of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. By implication, all the supposed types which observers say they find in nature and history and which point to the true God are counterfeit, pointing instead to things other than the true God, merely imagined in likeness to the observers. In a word, they are idols. The search for types is a wild goose chase with a pagan God at its end. But I would submit to you, along with Pannenberg and Burkauer and others, that Bart was practicing asegesis rather than, than exegesis. He was reading into rather than out of the text. When the psalmist said of the voices of the creation that they are not heard, he probably meant that their voice is not understood rather than that it is not sounded. For he went on to say that these voices go out through all the earth and reach to the end of the world. The point seems to be that their voices are sounded to all the world, not just Israel. Something is being proclaimed to the world outside of Israel, even if it's not always understood or received. And in Romans, Paul says the same thing. In seven different ways, Paul says that God is making himself known to what seems to be every human heart on which he has written his law. That's the first way of seven. Back in Romans 1, he claims that what can be known um, genoston, uh, about God, that's, that's number two, is plain, phaneron, to them, three, because God has shown it to them, aphaneros, sen, four, ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood, fifth, and seen, sixth, anoumena, a 
through the things he has made. So they are without excuse, for though they knew God, Genontes 7, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. Bart is right that Paul suggests that this general revelation simply leads to condemnation. Uh, simply leads to condemnation. The apostle does say that these same human beings exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. But we must understand three things. First, Paul was speaking of the universal tendency of every human being to turn away from God to self and world. This was true of every believer before the grace of God turned him back to God. It speaks of the fall, not redemption from fall, of the tendency to misread the signs in creation, not the legitimacy of the signs themselves. Just because our sinful tendency before redemption, um, before redemption is to misread, uh, does not mean that once redeemed, we cannot learn to read properly. Second, Paul repeatedly declares that the message comes through loudly and clearly that there's a creator who is divine and eternally powerful. Third, scripture suggests that some fallen creatures see something in the signs to encourage a search for the true sign maker. Paul told the Athenians on Mars Hill that God allotted the times of human beings' existence and the boundaries of their places where they should live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. So Psalm 19 and Romans 1 teach that there's natural revelation from God. God speaks through nature of his existence and power and deity. Most use this revelation most of the time for, idol for idolatrous purposes, yes, but it's revelation nonetheless. Scripture suggests that some unbelievers use this natural revelation as an incentive to search for the true God. This search, if it's successful, always leads to the Trinitarian God of Scripture and is both inspired by and led by the Holy Spirit. Human nature by itself is powerless to see the meaning of the signs or, or to follow them to the true God. But God uses his signs to open eyes to his glory in the creation. So what can we finally say about Bart? Bart rightly warned of our temptation to confuse culture with Christ. But his rejection of scripture's testimony to natural revelation was more the result of an a priori view of revelation than an unprejudiced reading of the text itself. So Bart departed from the majority view of the great tradition that while there is no saving knowledge of God in nature, there is nevertheless true knowledge that's available even to the unregenerate. And the great traditions view that the regenerate have available to them a near infinite panoply of revelations in man and the world testifying to the truths of redemption by the triune God. So Bart departed from Basil and Gregory Nazianzus and Augustine and Thomas and Calvin and Edwards on this, and even from many of the Lutheran and Reformed scholastics. Jonathan Edwards and the typological tradition of the church, therefore, I would suggest in closing, invite us to what Richard Hayes has called a conversion of the imagination. Most of our culture has been blinded by its deep familiarity with the secular world and its foolish presumption that science explains the world. Bard and other voices in 20th century theology have shielded us from the historic church's dazzling vision of this world, God's creation, that is thoroughly typological. As a result, we have missed out on abundant beauty, joy, and fulfillment. Edwards' typological vision is an invitation to be healed. He calls on us to let the Spirit open our eyes to the riches of the creation, the innumerable facets of the surrounding worlds that, il that illustrate the glory of God. Thank you. Thank Should you very much, here? Jerry. Yeah, please stay up here. We do have about 20 minutes for questions and discussion. Uh, again, we're recording this uh, lecture and the Q&A time, so please, uh, if you've got a question, make your way up to one of the microphones, and uh, we'll ask you just to tell us who you are very briefly and pose a brief question uh, for Jerry. And I see we already have one from Gavin, so we'll start with you. 
Uh, thank you very much for being here. That was very interesting. Um, I'm curious about to what extent is the revelation of God's goodness in creation an obvious, unavoidable reality? What was the word after obvious? Unavoidable versus something that re does require trust and, mm -hmm. and faith. And mm -hmm. what, kind of what's on my mind is, um, so for example, uh, at the beginning of C.S. Lewis's book, The Problem of Pain, he says, not many years ago, if you asked me why I'm an atheist, I would say, look at the world. It's filled with empty space, it's cold, it's dark, there's pain that attends life and so forth. How would Edwards, for example, what, what would they say about that way of looking at the world? Is there a sincere struggle there, or is that just a willful suppression of the truth? Yeah, um, uh, I thought you were asking in the beginning of the question what I think, and then at the end you turn it to Edwards. And I, uh, so I'll give an answer I think that Edwards uh, would give, and that is that um, God-given, our God-given sensibilities, which include reason, do testify to the, to the unregenerate that, that the world is made by God. And God is powerful, God's deity, you know, Romans 1. But that we also suppress the truth. The unregenerate man, as Paul says also in, in Romans 1, suppresses the truth. You know, that's his argument. That God gives this truth through all of nature, but our human sinful tendency is to suppress the truth and, and push it away from us. So both things are going on. Now, um, I do think that if, that if Edwards were writing in the 20th century, as C.S. Lewis did, in a changed cultural consensus, from 18th century New England and England where there was overwhelmingly a Christian culture, if, if, uh, uh, if not Christian orthodoxy, and there, was, there, there were many departures, you know, big, you know, big time uh, you know, departures from, from Christian orthodoxy, um, uh, that, that he would agree with C.S. Lewis in the 20th century that it's, it's a, a lot less obvious to the average man and woman uh, than it used to be. But I think he would insist that, hey, uh, humans are created the same way in the 20th century as in the 18th, as in the 14th and 4th and 1st, and that God has created all human beings, stamping his law in their hearts in the 20th as well as the 18th century, and that creation is embedded with types really shouting out the glory of God. Um, and so it's still available. And there's still a suppression of the truth. Both things are going on. So Jerry, just piggybacking on this, yeah. and thinking about pastors and theologians in the room who are wondering, so what should we do with this? Do you think in the 21st century in the U.S., people doing evangelism, people doing apologetics should make arguments based on natural types, based on natural theology to people in the hope that God will use these arguments to prepare them for the gospel? Or, or should we think of this in terms of the code language you were using in the beginning of your talk? I mean, there's some some folks who think it's just enough to leave people without excuse. It's a code. You're not going to crack the code unless you're spiritually regenerated. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't overdo uh, arguments based on design, based on right. nature. We right. should pray for conversion. Mm -hmm. And once they get a sense of the heart, you know, then they'll have eyes to see. And then we can t teach these things to believers right. to shore up their faith and it, right. enhance their knowledge of God. But right. What should we do with the seekers or the skeptics yeah. evangelistically with this? Well, you know, there are skeptics and there are skeptics. There are non-Christians and there are non-Christians of all different types. And, you know, those of you, well, even right here in Illinois, uh, I'm sure in the Chicago area, um, non-Christians non are all, all over the map. 
there are some who are truly seeking and some who are absolutely closed. And it, it won't do a bit of good to, you know, try to talk to those who are closed. But, but there are, you know, our, our, our post-Christian society, uh, and even when I travel around the world and talk to people, I, I find the same thing. And it'd be interesting to hear from Harold about his experience in Japan. Um, I find there are seekers everywhere. And there are non-Christians, uh, you know, Muslims and, and animists and Buddhists e everywhere who resonate when you talk about the beauty of the world. And, and doesn't that suggest that this world is not just atoms and molecules? Now, uh, I find it very interesting that when Paul is the evangelist in Athens, and he's talking to these philosophers who have never heard of Jesus Christ and didn't even know, they probably knew a tiny bit by reputation about Judaism, but didn't know much at all about Jews and their strange religion. Um, what, what, what does Paul talk about? In, in his evangelistic talk to these very pagan philosophers, does he mention God's love, which, which you know, it's almost the first word out of our mouths, right? When, when, you know, when we're talking to a non-Christian. No, not a word about God's love. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, does he talk about justification by grace? Not a word, not a word. What, what does he talk about? He says, hey, there's judgment coming and you better get ready. And I know who the judge is because he rose from the dead and I've had personal experience with this guy. I mean, basically, and he, and he appeals to them by some of their own poets. And he says, you know, there's truth in what some of your own poets have said about the true God. So what's he appealing to? I, I think he's appealing to Romans 2, their, their, their nature. He's appealing to nature, their human nature, their conscience. They know deep down that they've been wrong in all sorts of ways. And he's saying, you're going to face the judgment. So um, Paul appeals to nature, it, it, you know, in this case, human nature. And he appeals also, yeah, but God, you know, God creating signs. And, and when he gave another evangelistic, uh, uh, you, you know, presentation, he he talks about God's goodness through nature. You know, he gives us rain and sun. He appeals to, to he, he, he speaks about the self-evident goodness of God to these non-Christians through the beauty and the wonders and the providential orderings of nature. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, I have a two-fold question. So when we are baptized or illuminated by the Holy Spirit, we are able to see the glory of God in nature. So when we say that, what do we exactly mean by nature? Does it mean like nature as seen by the naked eye or the nature as told by modern science? And if the latter is the case, what about those parts of nature that seem to contradict our knowledge of the glory of God? Okay. Um, so the question is, did everyone hear that? Yeah? All right, I don't need to repeat the question. Uh, how about those parts of nature that seem to contradict the glory of God or, or seem to contradict the goodness of God? Well, I mean, um, I, I think I touched on that toward the beginning of my talk that, uh, you know, nature red in tooth and claw. Um, uh, Paul, Paul speaks to that, I believe, when, when he talks in Romans 8 uh, and, and talks in Romans 5 about the fall and, and in Romans 8 about creation groaning for its ultimate liberation. Um, uh, obviously, if it's groaning, there's, there's something wrong. And it all goes back to a rebellion, not only human, but angelic rebellion, right? Um, so, I mean, Paul would say, um, if you think 
nature red in tooth and claw and nature groaning uh, contradicts the glory of God, you just don't understand the original story of creation, which is all about a fall. So what we did and what the angels did have radically affected nature and damaged nature. So it's no surprise that, that there are these, these massive dislocations in nature that, that, that hurt animals and hurt human beings. And, but, but the glory is that the end of nature, the liberation of nature has already appeared on earth in the person of the Jewish Messiah. And so now we have tremendous hope and confidence that, that these so-called contradictions are going to work out beautifully to the glory of God. And the liberation of animals and human beings and trees and oceans and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your lecture, uh, Professor McDermott. Let me ask you a, a follow-up on the so what question. If I understood the first part of your talk correctly, the modern triad of uh, Marx, Darwin, and Freud, there's a way in which the loss of typology in our natural world, our humanities, if you will, and the human psyche, have been conceded to a kind of lowest common denominator. And even though we've given a theological account that still makes them orthodox, if you will, we've lost the typological account of the world, right? The way that it points to God above. Am I hearing you right on that point? Just to make yes. Sure? Okay. So my follow-up question then is if we reaffirm a typological world, what are the implications if you're a natural scientist, if you're working in the humanities, uh, if you're working in the human realm, whether it be uh, something like, we have a psychology, or a, um, not psychology, but a mental health counseling department here, but there's a huge medical industry that we have. Those would seem to be three fields that directly correlate with the, the modern triad. Does, is there any implication for how Christians working in those fields, if they held a typological account of the world, would think and act differently in the world? Well, perhaps. Now, the, it's, it's medical counseling. What was the third? Oh, well, if you're triad, I took to be the natural world, the uh, humanities, and oh, so human psyche all, in general. Yeah. So yeah. I guess I'm just wondering, does it have an implication for how we actually think about the world in our various secular disciplines? And I think there's pastoral implications to the question as well in terms of how we, how we guide our congregants. I know Taylor just left, but another center on campus here yeah. Uh, is very much interested in the faith and work conversation. And uh, so if the doctrine of creation needs to be rehabilitated, typology is an important way of rehabilitating. I guess I'm trying to figure out the so what beyond um, uh, the theological, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out the wider so what implications. Right, right. Would, if you were a well, chemist, does the uh, typology if I were a change chemist, the way? Yeah. You know, I, I find my, my science friends in the hard sciences, you know, uh, I, I find all sorts of believers, not only Orthodox Christians, but unorthodox Christians and Muslims and Jews who are in the sciences, but, but particularly Christians. Now let's focus on the Christians. Uh, you know, and there are thousands, probably millions of Christians in the hard sciences, despite what the media would have us believe. Uh, you know, they're under the radar. They often fly, fly under the radar. Is that uh, those, those on the Protestant side who, um, who have taken in from their pastors and theologians this Bardian notion that um, they aren't supposed to presume that these are all signs of God, that that's theologically illegitimate. Uh, but they believe it anyway. And, you know, they talk about the awe and, and the joy that they find in chemistry and physics, seeing these remarkable uh, beauties uh, that it encourages them, it, that it gives them more theological self confidence to actually feel the joy, as it were, and not feel that they're, you know, um, being theologically wrong headed to appreciate the beauty in their work, you know, that they see. Now, that's 
Not, not, that's my first response. I've got a follow-up question that's kind of general in nature. I hesitate to ask it because it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to answer it simply, but yeah. as I've been listening to you and Jeff talk, I've been wondering yeah. how, how natural do you want our natural theology to be? How much recourse do you want us to make to scripture, special revelation, to regulate it, to correct it, to fix it? Versus how much latitude do you want? To fix or correct the, the natural theology? Yeah, to the oh, yeah. natural theology. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. But of course, the error on the one side is that you only do natural theology insofar as you have some kind of direct biblical warrant for doing it. Ah. And then you're not really getting much extra right. by doing it. The error right. on the other side is you get right. this freewheeling natural theology, people are just making stuff up <laughs> that obviously doesn't <laughs> comport very well. Right. with the teachings right. of Scripture. Right. So what I'm trying to work on is a question that gets you talking yeah, about yeah. how do you want us to think yeah. about yeah. natural theology vis-a-vis -vis Scripture yeah. and how much latitude do you want to give us right. to reflect, even yeah. if we get things wrong, about the knowledge of God available yeah. to us in the natural world. By the book. <laughs> no, um, seriously. Uh, uh, this lecture was taken out of really my first chapter in the appendix, um, not from the bulk of the book. And um, one, one, one of the chapters is, is on the Bible. Um, and my, the thesis of the chapter in the Bible is that the Bible is a world of types. And Edwards would say near infinite types in the Bible. That is the key to unlocking the types and discerning the types outside the Bible, out there in the world. So yeah, scripture is still the final uh, corrective. But uh, Ed, Ed, now, now, now Edward said to those who criticized him for going beyond the express, explicit explanations by the Bible of particular types and going to find types out there in the world that the Bible didn't, you know, that you can't find a proof text for, Edward said, no, wait a minute, no, wait a minute. How many times does the Old Testament expressly tell us that this is a messianic prophecy or this is a messianic type? Uh, does it ever? And when, and Jesus criticizes his disciples for not understanding the types. And did Jesus ever explicitly explain them to them? I mean, it's certainly not in the Gospels. So he's saying, you know, um, I think if he were here today, he, he, he would say that's a fundamentalist, literalist way of trying to justify types. It's the whole story of the Bible that is the explanation of the way to discern biblical types. It's the biblical story. Uh, now, of course, there are illegitimate types, and uh, I get into some of those in that chapter on the Bible. But, but uh, just to give you an idea, too, the bulk of the book um, is actually, you know, in those first two chapters and, and this talk I just gave you, uh, I'm just sharpening knives. But we're actually, you know, I actually got to get to cut meat in, in the majority of the book. So I, so I got a whole chapter on nature, a whole chapter on modern science, a whole chapter on history, a chapter on law, a chapter on animals, focusing on birds and dogs, primarily a chapter on sports, and a chapter on sex. Now I know probably most people will not be interested in the chapter on sex, but but I threw it in there anyway. So. Eugene, are you coming to ask a question? Please come. I was trying to decide whether to close the meeting or, or wait, but I'll wait for you. Uh, thank you for a great lecture. Um, so on the one hand, you place uh, Karl Barth and, and the, all the other theologians from Thomas Aquinas and reformers, and I agree. And then in the one sense, you 
explain kind of differences between Rousseau and Aquinas. Um, so I think it's a kind of generalization, but I want to ask where do you want to put Jonathan Edwards um, regarding the relation between grace and nature? So on the one side, Thomas Aquinas, and then the other side, reformers, Rousseau and Calvin. Um, do you think Jonathan Edwards, where is the more close in Jonathan Edwards' view on relation, grace and nature? Who is he closest to in the history of, of theology, or? Yeah, I mean, I mean the, so, so on one, one hand, to Thomas Aquinas, right. say, um, he said nature uh, is, I mean, oh, is a great uh, thing to um, find God. Mm -hmm. And then the other side, Luther, um, he, he more um, say that more emphasized on grace than nature. I, mean, all, I know you see he has some kind of acceptance of nature, but he more, more emphasized on grace than nature. So right, right, right. Um, where is in um, Jordan Edwards, whose view is more close? He's more like Thomas or Luther. Or oh, Luther. so is Edwards more, more like Thomas or Luther? Yeah, I mean, just, just All right. regarding the nature. Well, on, on creation, I think Edwards is closer to Thomas than to Luther. Now, you know, you know, every theologian has to be understood in his context. And, you know, Luther was rightly reacting against the semi-Pelagianism in the 14th and 15th centuries, where um, it was suggested that, uh, um, uh, that that to some degree nature can, co can, can help with grace to save someone. Um, and so, you know, Luther, um, most of what he does is a, a doctrine of redemption, uh, grace, 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 um, which needed to be said in the 16th century. But his um, relative, not complete, but relative denigration of, Re uh, of revelation in nature. Um, uh, unlike most of the Lutheran scholastics who followed him, by the way, who believed in revelation through nature, you know, the book of nature, not that it can save, but that it can, it can and does testify, even to natural man, even to unregenerate man. Uh, but you know, because of his Luther's near obsession with getting redemption right, uh, there tends to be not so much balance between redemption and creation in Luther as there is, in my opinion, in Thomas Aquinas and in Jonathan Edwards. And so to answer your question, Ed Edwards on that, a proper balance between creation and redemption, uh, Edwards is closer to, to Thomas than to Luther on that. And to help Luther out a little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he does have a natural theology, and mm. he's the one who, in the Christological and Eucharistic debates with the Reformed, mm. is arguing there are points of contact between earth and heaven. The finite mm. does have a capacity for the infinite. Okay. The Reformed were the ones rejecting that notion, and Luther right. was the one defending that notion yep. as a very yep. incarnational guy. Good point. Thank so. you. <laughs> I don't see any more questions. Let's thank Jerry for a great talk. Mm -hmm.